Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Association Lifelong Learners presentation of Fatal Crossings, Lost Railroad, Car Ferries of the Great Lakes, being presented by Jeff Thomas. He is a local history te teacher and part-time Great Lakes sailor. And he draws on both experiences to tell the story of the Great Lakes shipwrecks. He finds the small details that brings the stories to life and a storytelling experience that puts the viewer in the moments of the dramatic tales. Jeff, the floor is yours. Thanks for that introduction. It makes me feel like I'm somebody. All right. Um, let's see here if I can. Okay, so yeah, so uh, thanks for having me back. And I've been looking forward to this one. This is actually, of, of all my shows that I do, this is one of my favorites to present. Um, I've found myself getting really interested in the railroad car ferry era of the Great Lakes. And so tonight I'm going to tell you the story of three and a half shipwrecks. Wait to the end to find out about the half. Um, but before I get into the, the shipwreck part of it, <clears throat> part of this story begins with a question of why. And if we look at a map here, um, you start thinking about trains. And so the, the car ferry era really takes off uh, in the late 1800s and really hits its peak into the early 20th century. And if you look at this map, uh, of course, we all know Chicago was the big railroad hub of its time. And when you're, when you're putting trains together in Detroit, Toledo, and Cleveland, um, you would think that they would just, you know, head west to Chicago, slingshot around the bottom of Lake Michigan, and keep on heading out west. What we see end up happening is these railroad companies are going to send their trains north to places like Frankfurt, Ludington, and Grand Haven. They're going to unhook the cars, load them on a ship, sail them across the lake, unload the cars, hook them up to a new engine, and then travel west. And I had to ask myself, why? What business model makes that financially feasible? You've got to think with all that extra handling that that's adding cost. Come to find out, for as famous as Chicago gets to be as a railroad hub, at the beginning of that time, they weren't very efficient. And train cars could get stuck in that town for a week or more. So it actually ends up lowering the railroad's cost by $3 a ton to sail them across the lake. And in 1900, 1910, 1920, that's a lot of money. And so that's how where we see the cities like Frankfurt and Ludington really grow into what they become here in Michigan. And we see large fleets of railroad car ferries, a ship that ends up becoming fairly unique to just the Great Lakes. Not saying there haven't been ferry boats in other places in the world, but this particular design and this particular concept is unique to the Great Lakes. And I always like to point out, this is not a third party uh, fleet that's hauling these railroad cars. Okay? The train companies themselves build the fleets and they operate them. So they are in essence, a part of the rail line. Taking a little bit of look at the construction of them, because I said they're, they're a pretty unique design to this area. We still have one unaltered railroad car ferry with us. It's a museum in Manistee. This is the city of Milwaukee. This boat was actually built to replace one of the ones that sank that I'm gonna tell you about tonight. And uh, fortunately she didn't uh, have the same bad luck as her predecessor. So you can still go aboard her and see this really unique design. You see that large, uh, gate at the stern of the boat. So these, these boats were loaded and unloaded through the back or the stern. And so what they would do is they would back into the dock and there are railroad tracks on board the ship. And when they make the dock, they match up perfectly with tracks on land and they can roll the cars off, roll the next ones on. And it was run kind of like a train. So there's a schedule. You will stick to the schedule. Sailors hate sticking to schedules. Our favorite saying is hurry up and wait, but not on the car ferries. And here you can see the car deck and you can see these rows of, of railroad tracks 
typically they were four rows wide. So they could, they could load these things four rows of cars wide. Um, on average, I'll say that they could carry about 30 cars at a time. Uh, the early ones were a bit less than that. The later ones were a bit more than that. And those numbers changed a bit. Um, on some of the car, on some of the ferries, because as time progresses, we see the size of train cars change. And so I'll give you an average of about 30 per, per load for these vessels. And here you can see the, how they would store these box cars. You can see that big scissor jack there underneath it, take the tension off the springs because the last thing you want and anyone who has ever sailed on water realizes it's never a smooth trip. And especially if you're going across Lake Michigan, instead of up and down it, it's going to be even rougher. And the last thing you need is a couple ton box cars, 30 of them at a time, swaying back and forth. So they would get the tension off those springs, they would secure them. And you see those yellow clamps that are actually clamped onto the rail. Those were chocks that were designed to keep the, uh, keep the cars from sliding back and forth on the rails because if you get in a storm and you start having these rows of train cars start trying to slide around on the rails, you're going to be in a world of trouble. And that's going to cause one of the stories I'm gonna tell you about tonight too. Okay, so the hub of railroad car ferries was Lake Michigan. And that's not to say there weren't some other places, but the epicenter of this is on Lake Michigan. And they are really going from places like Ludington and Frankfurt and Grand Haven to, uh, and they're just going to crisscross the lake. They're going to places like Menominee, Michigan and Milwaukee and Manitowoc. And they, they're going to go back and forth across the lakes. That is all they do. Each boat is on a dedicated run between two cities. That's all they do. And we're going to see the heavy hitters of the railroad of the, of the time build their own fleets. We're going to see the Pear Marquette line and the Grand Trunk and the Ann Arbor fleets. Okay. The, these are the premier railroad companies of the time that are doing this. And on average, their, their fleets are going to be anywhere at any given time, eight, 10, sometimes a little over 15 boats per company. This is not just one or two boats. This is an, these are entire fleets. Their whole job is to crisscross the lake. One other thing about the early car ferries, and I showed you the picture of the museum ship that had that large sea gate, which obviously its intent was to keep the sea out of the boat. The early ones you can see in this picture didn't have one. And you see here, uh, you can actually see the guys standing there on the stern these boats sailed out with absolutely nothing to keep the water out. There was no protection from the seas whatsoever. And that gave captains uh, some fits when it came to rough weather. Sometimes there, there are cases where we see car ferries going 100 miles out of their way because they had to keep that open stern away from the wind and waves. Um, we look at this picture now, and we go, what are you thinking? Um, it does not take a naval architect to realize you need to have a way to keep water out of your ship. That is sailing 101. But these are railroad car ferries. They are to stick to the railroad schedule. These companies want these boats to hit the dock, start unloading cars, load the next set, and away they go again. They call them row rows, roll on, roll off. They didn't want to waste time having to open the boat up to get these cars on and off. So I said the epicenter of this story is Lake Michigan. That is where most of the car ferries were. So obviously my first story happens on Lake Erie. With the Marquette and Bessemer number two. Uh, I hope you like numbers because uh, the railroads also were not creative namers. They're going to use numbers in most of their ship names. And the Marquette and Bessemer number two, uh, she's gonna be 350 feet long, 54 feet wide, and she's launched for the Marquette and Bessemer Dock and Navigation Company in 1905. The car ferries were the strongest vessels going of their day, where we all know about winter layup. The ore boats spend the winter at the dock safely tucked away until the ice disappears. It was expected that these car ferries would run year round. 
and it is their job to bash their way through winter ice in January and February and early March. So these were very, uh, very broad, very powerful ships. And the Marquette and Bessemer is really, when she's launched in 1905, she is representing the best of the car ferries even. And her job is to run from Conneaut, Ohio, all the way up here to Port Stanley, Ontario, and back again. So they're actually leaving the country. They're going to Canada with, car, uh, with railroad cars. So on December 7th of 1909, long before that date became famous for other ships being sunk, the Marquette and Bessemer number two is gonna sail out of Conneaut, Ohio, loaded with railroad cars. And the forecast is pretty good. It's for early December, it's forecasted to be cold. The winds are supposed to die down. The next day is supposed to be pretty fair. And the sailors on board are thinking they got pretty lucky. You don't get forecasts like that in early December on the Great Lakes. Unfortunately, like he always is, the weatherman was wrong. Instead, what hit Lake, hits Lake Erie is a full gale, and it's going to take down three ships on Lake Erie that evening, including the big car ferry. 52 sailors are going to be lost in total in this storm, and it's going to be 32 from the Marquette and Bessemer number two, and she simply disappears for a while, but she never arrives in Port Stanley, Ontario. What does start being found is wreckage, and bodies. In one yellow boat, there are nine bodies on board, including the ship's cook. Another yellow boat comes ashore with three more victims on board. And it's, it's the story about the boat with the nine, the one with the ship's cook. So we don't know where this legend came from. I was not able to find it in actual newspapers. But it has been published enough that it has become legend. And as they say, when legend becomes fact, print the legend. What they say is the ship's cook was in the lifeboat and he still had his apron on and jammed into the gunnel or the side of the lifeboat was his big meat cleaver. Not something one would necessarily think about grabbing when abandoning a sinking ship. Not a lot of life-saving qualities to a meat cleaver. And no one can figure out why. Why would he do that? <laughs> Maybe. Um, legend also has it the next spring, the captain's body washed ashore and had large gashes in it. So was there a form of mutiny going on? Was the captain trying to still save the ship and his crew wanted to get off it? We don't know. Again, I can't verify that story through the news, but it has become the legend. Some of the victims showed bruising and some cuts on their faces. This was clearly a very violent sinking. This, uh, these men were, were trying to get off a ship that was sinking fast. It was hectic and it was dangerous. And as the lake starts to give up these dead, it's pretty obvious that whatever happened to the Marquette and Bessemer number two, it was catastrophic. There's always people who say they, uh, they knew this had happened or they knew it was going to. So the sister of crewman John Clancy claims to have had a premonition that the ship had gone down one girl claims to have had a dream that she saw all 32. This article said 33 uh, men. So she claimed to have had a dream about all of them as the ship was sinking. Apparently, one of the crewmen had written a note saying that this was going to be his last trip on this car ferry. He didn't think it was seaworthy. And that after this trip, he was going to quit. Some people, on the idea of being seaworthy, some people wondered if it might not have been the ship's own cargo that drove it to the bottom. 
She was loaded with railroad cars, but apparently some people claimed that on top of some of the railroad cars, there were beams of bridge iron. And people think that in the gale that those iron beams may have shifted or fallen down and, and changed the weight of the boat and perhaps even capsized it. I would question where that came from. That's not a very safe way to load a boat. And I can't believe that that really happened, but who knows? They were sending them out with open sterns. So never assume. Uh, one sailor survived the sinking because he was in the hospital. He had taken pneumonia and he had been in the hospital and therefore missed the sailing. There was another survivor of the Marquette and Bessemer number two, and that would be one of the porters. Uh, so he worked in the galley. It was his job to help prepare meals and clean the dishes. He was presumed to have gone down with the ship and his family had been notified. When two weeks later, John Lawrence walks into the company office and says, I'm alive. Turns out he missed the boat in the last time it left Ontario and he wasn't aboard. Why it took two weeks for him to tell his company he hadn't drowned, I don't know. And I really wish I could see the looks on the people's faces when the dead guy walked in the front door. The Marquette and Bessemer number two is somewhere. And people don't know exactly where. What people are pretty convinced of at the time is that she's pretty close to shore. The question is, what shore? People claim to have heard their whistle. One dock worker said that in the early morning hours of the 8th, he heard it just off of Conneaut. And people that live in towns that had car ferries, they knew their whistles. Car ferry whistles tended to be a distinct sound. And there's tales of ore boat captains when they were going up and down Lake Michigan they could tell a car ferry by the sound of their whistle. When they heard certain whistles, they knew they had a car ferry crossing somewhere in front of them. These people, these boats were only in two ports. So the people of those two port cities, they learned these boats. They were like friends to them. They knew the sound of their voice. But then the reports start conflicting. Originally, in the afternoon of the 7th, this one is accurate. A, or a government official in Port Stanley saw the Marquette and Bessemer number two not be able to make it into the port in the gale. And he saw the ship turn around and leave. And he's going to be the last person to see her afloat ever that we know of. The night of the seventh, people claim to have heard her whistle a little bit to the east of Conneaut. Someone claims to have heard it at 1.30 in the morning of December 8th off Conneaut. The problem is an hour and a half later, someone claimed to have heard her whistling distress signals off Port Stanley. No way are they making that trip in an hour and a half in good weather, much less in a gale. So somebody was mistaken. The question is who? Someone else claimed to have heard her about five o'clock in the morning off Port Stanley. So we have reports on both sides of the lakes. The last confirmed report we have is the government official on the afternoon of the 7th when she could not make it into Port Stanley. After that, it's guess and speculation. And it's going to stay that way because the wreck has not been found to date. We don't know. And that's really kind of surprising because Lake Erie is the shallowest of the Great Lakes and honestly, the most explored. So if she hasn't been found, that tells me personally, and this is my speculation, two things. There is an area out there sort of near Port Stanley that is rather deep. I would suspect that perhaps she's in that one deep spot. And I would suspect that she's probably closer to Port Stanley because the Canadian government is much more strict about shipwreck hunting than we are. And so a lot of people don't go searching for wrecks in Canadian waters because it's too much of a hassle to get the proper permits. I believe if she was in American waters that she would have been found a long time ago. But hopefully at some point someone finds her and we'll know for sure. But until then, she's still missing. Okay, so now we can go to Lake Michigan 
after I told you that most of the car ferry traffic was on that lake. The miles between Port Stanley and Conneaut, I'm not sure exactly, um, but it would have been about a five hour trip or so, I believe. So that would put it 60 miles maybe. And that's, that's kind of a guess. So take that with a whole bag of salt, but somewhere in that, that range. The Pear Marquette 18 is going to be the next car ferry to disappear. She's launched in 1902. She's 338 feet long, 56 feet wide, and she's going to sail for the Pear Marquette line. Her job is to go from Ludington to Milwaukee and back. So she's going to go and crisscross across the lake here, hauling railroad car fare or railroad cars, except for three summers from 1907 to 1910. During the summer, she is chartered to an excursion company in Chicago, and she becomes basically a day cruise boat. You can see all the people in, the, in this picture here, all the people along the rail, and they put a wooden dance floor over the train tracks on the car deck, and there's bands up topside, and they take several hundred people out for a day cruising around Lake Michigan and bring them back at night. So she's chartered out for that just during the summer. And then in the fall, she goes back to Ludington and she goes back to what she was designed to do, carry trains. Apparently, this company that chartered her, rumor has it they didn't take too good a care of her. And perhaps they weren't the seamen they should have been and they kind of beat her up, ran her into some docks, things like that. And Captain Kilty, who ran her on the, on the car ferry route, apparently was not very pleased in 1910 when he got his boat back. And he, rumor is that he, he banged his elbow on the side of the hull and said you could crack it like an eggshell. She was so fragile. But as any good train man, when the company says go out, you go out. And so he loads his ship. And on September 9th, 1910, they depart for Milwaukee. And somewhere out in the lake, it doesn't get to be a storm. It does get to be a little rough, some, some seas, but not a gale, not a storm. And a crewman comes running up from down below saying there's massive flooding. No one can figure out where from. And so one of the officers goes down with him to check it out. And it's quickly apparent that this, this is the type of flooding that will sink the ship. So Captain Kildee orders the 18 to be run straight toward the Wisconsin shoreline. And a new thing happens. He orders his wireless operator to issue a distress call. Now wireless is completely new technology. This is 1910. This is two years before the Titanic makes that famous. And so he's going to, he's going to call for help with this wireless radio. And unfortunately, it's not going to come in time. And the car ferry number 18 is going to go down and 28 are going to be lost. Not everyone on board because someone did hear the distress call. And it's going to be the captain of her sister ship, the Pear Marquette 17. I told you the car ferries weren't creative in naming boats. And so the captain of the 17 kind of like the Titanic story, he orders his crew to drive their ship as fast as it'll go to where the 18 is foundering. And it's really one of the saddest shipwreck stories on the Great Lakes because the 17 actually almost arrives in time. The people on the 18 are up on deck and they're abandoning ship, they're lowering the lifeboats and the 17 comes steaming onto the scene and Captain Kilty is out on deck and he grabs his megaphone and he yells at his fellow captain to sail around the other side to get to use the sinking ship as a windbreak to help get more people off the 18. And so the 17 goes to perform that maneuver. And as they're getting in position to start affecting the rescue, the Pear Marquette 18 suddenly tips bow up 
and drops to the bottom of Lake Michigan, right in front of the rescue ship. People are thrown into the water. Many are saved, but 28 are lost in total. In the aftermath of that sinking, first off, this boat, the Pair Marquette 15, sometimes this particular presentation sounds more like a math class, but the Pair Marquette 15 is brought onto that run to replace the 18. I don't know if I would sail on the 15 because she had to be brought back to Lake Michigan because she had been on Lake Erie replacing the Marquette and Bessemer number two. So the 15's job apparently was to replace car ferries that sank. I don't know if I'd get on that boat. And some of the victims had a hard time uh, recovering from this. Uh, a couple of them, in fact, went insane and wound up having to be committed just from the stress of what they went through. One guy used it as a great, great way to announce a new invention. He decided that or he came up with a way to supposedly raise shipwrecks with giant magnets. And he was going to prove that it was useful by raising the 18. The only problem is no one knew where the wreck was. Step one to, to raising a shipwreck, know where it is. So that idea went nowhere. The sinking of the 18 made a huge impact on the town of Ludington. That was her home port. Many of her crew were from there, including Captain Peter Kilty, who you see here. And the news was very, very kind to him uh, at his funeral. And he was the quintessential ship captain. He literally went down with his ship. His ship sank out from underneath his feet as he was directing rescue attempts for his passengers. And when you think of the legend of a ship captain, you think of Peter Kildee. And the entire city of Ludington turned out for his funeral and also the chief engineers. But the greatest honor was given to the wireless operator. A couple of years later in New York City, this monument was created. This is the wireless operator, Marconi Wireless Operators Memorial in New York City and is dedicated to people of the Marconi Wireless Company who went down on ships. And the wireless operator from the Pair Marquette 18 was given the honor of having his name inscribed right below the famous Jack Phillips from the Titanic. So what happened? When a ship sinks, people always want to know what happened. And in true government form, the investigation said, I don't know. They really, uh, they struggled to come up with a reason. Why would this ship randomly start flooding? There was no known damage. There wasn't a collision. Someone simply walked below deck and found massive flooding. There were rumors that perhaps a porthole had either been left open or had sprung open in the seas but no one really knew. They claimed that just the day before, the steamboat inspectors had gone over the ship and had found nothing wrong with it. But just in the uh, interest of safety, the Pair Marquette line announced that they were going to be fitting all of their vessels with a six foot high sea gate to keep water out of their boats. Seems reasonable. I would have thought that would have been something thought of when you built them, but they're going to finally put a sea gate to keep the water out. And while they are not critical of the ship's crew, they do say that perhaps the loss of life could have been avoided if the officers had not been too brave. They say that Kilty and his officers did not recognize that the ship was lost in time and they should have begun abandoning ship earlier. I would love to tell you more, but the Paramark 18, I think, is going to keep her secrets. She actually was found just recently in 2020. One, uh, one thing about the COVID shutdown, the shipwreck hunters had nothing else to do, so they spent a lot of time looking for missing boats, and they finally found 
the pair Marquette 18, but she is speared into the lake bottom at such an angle that the bow is actually 100 feet off the bottom of the lake, much the same angle that she sank at. And so any access inside the ship is buried in the Lake Michigan mud. And I think she's going to take her secret with her forever. And then we have to go to 1929. Finally, a boat name with no numbers. This is the Milwaukee. And she's named that she's, uh, because her main run is going to be going to Milwaukee. They didn't get any more creative. They just took the numbers away. And she's going to sail for the Grand Trunk Line. She's going to be the biggest of the three that I tell you about. She's 383 feet long, 56 feet wide. And she was launched, if you thought we were totally done with the numbers, she was launched as the Manistique, Marquette, and Northern Number One. Thankfully, they changed the name to Milwaukee in 1909. Because I don't want to say that name over and over again. So now she's the Milwaukee. And she's going to go from Grand Haven to Milwaukee and back straight across the southern part of Lake Michigan. And so it's October 22nd, 1929. And she fights her way through a fall gale to get to Milwaukee. She, she arrives, makes the dock. And a couple of the sailors go up the street. They go to, they go get haircuts. They go to a movie theater because the storm is still getting worse. And they said, we know what we just went through to get here. There's no way we're turning around and going back out today. They forgot that they sailed with this guy, Robert McKay, whose nickname was Bad Weather Bob. Storms don't stop him. And so three crewmen actually get left behind in Milwaukee. The boat left without him in the middle of a rising gale because Bob, bad weather Bob was not going to fall off his schedule. He was a company man and he stayed to his schedule as best as he could. So they depart Milwaukee and the storm continues to get even worse. She's reported overdue at Grand Haven. Noon the next day comes. Still no word from the Milwaukee. 24 hours go by and there is still no word from the missing Milwaukee. That doesn't, it's concerning, but people aren't panicking and people are not saying she's lost yet for two reasons. One, the Grand Trunk Railroad had a reputation of being cheap. Guess who didn't put wireless radio on their ships like the Pair Marquette line did? So if they were just simply anchored in shelter somewhere, they couldn't tell anybody until they arrived in port. And also two other uh, car ferries, the Grand Rapids and the Grand Haven, finally arrived at their docks after 15 and 16 hour crossings that should have taken them seven or eight hours. So all the car ferries were having trouble in this storm. So they're concerned for the Milwaukee, but there are a lot of very possible reasons why she is still safe. And then the first body is picked up. A passing freighter finds a victim floating in Lake Michigan off Kenosha wearing a life jacket that reads Milwaukee. Two more are also picked up by another freighter off Kenosha. And it's obvious now that the Milwaukee is gone. And she's going to take 59 men with her. There will be no survivors from the Milwaukee. Men are picked up off Racine and off Kenosha. One guy, a coal passer. So this guy is his job to shovel coal into the boilers to keep the ship running. And he actually got off the boat. Uh, he had to go home for a uh, family reason. And he asked his shipmate to go with him. And his shipmate said, no, you go ahead. I'll stay and I'll stay and, and work this trip. So he survived by going home and his shipmate was lost in the sinking. His shipmate was his father. 
The son lived and the father died because one went home and one stayed. Soon after, there, was, uh, there were reports of a, of a sunken ship, mass sticking up through the water, and, and perhaps that would be, prove to be the Milwaukee. And boats go out looking for it. Nothing's ever spotted. So either it was a hoax, it was someone who thought they saw something they didn't. Mirages do happen out on the water. But whatever it was, it was not the Milwaukee, and it would take several years until that wreck would be found. But we do learn about what happened to her. We have a general idea of what time she sank because one of the victim's watches stopped at 9.45. But we learn about what happened to the Milwaukee from this guy. This is Richard Saden. He's the purser on the Milwaukee. So it's his job to uh, keep track of cargo manifests. He keeps track of the, of the railroad cars that come on the boat, go off the boat. He's in charge of crew payroll, uh, crew roster, all the administrative stuff. Now, I told you that the Grand Trunk did not put wireless on their boats. Richard Saden did not survive the sinking. So how does he tell us what happened to the Milwaukee? He quite literally sends us a message in a bottle. It was standard practice for many, many years on Great Lakes ships to carry a cork-lined brass canister that people could put notes and crew rosters in and throw overboard and hope that someone would find them washed ashore someday. The Milwaukee's canister is found and it contains this message. It says, Steamer Milwaukee, October 22nd, 6.30 p.m. So three hours or so before the victim's watch had stopped. He says, ship making water fast, have turned around and headed for Milwaukee. Pumps all working, but gate bent. Can't keep water clear. Flicker is flooded. Seas tremendous. Things look bad. Crew is same as last payroll, A.R. Saden. So the ship is damaged. That seagate that was supposed to keep the water out has been damaged. It's been bent, most likely by a railroad car crashing through it. Clearly, the chocks and the chains that hold them in place failed, and at least some of them crashed through the seagate. And we have a good concept that this is what happened because when the wreck was found, it's sitting on top of railroad cars. There's only one way railroad cars get underneath the shipwreck and they sink first. But think about it, the ship is sinking. Everyone is trying to figure out how to get off this thing. And Richard Saden has the presence of mind to write this note and put it in the ship's canister and throw it overboard. He makes sure that he fulfills his last duty of his post on the boat. Now he says the flicker is flooded. What's the flicker? This is the flicker. This is the cruise quarters on these car ferries. They were called the flicker because they were lighted with DC current and the light bulbs would flicker. You can see these are real comfortable quarters here. This is on board the museum ship that I showed you earlier. And through that little hatchway you see in the back, that's the engine room. So the crew is berthed way down here at the bottom of the boat, right next to the engines. So it's bad if that is flooding. That's beneath the water line, that's at the bottom of the ship. But it's the sea gate that was bent. So how does water get from the car deck, which you can kind of see that line in the middle of the boat, that's the car deck. How does water get from there to the bottom of the ship? Well, to learn that answer, the wreck had to be found, and it was. And look at the Seagate. It's bent almost in half. And underneath this wreck, there are, there are railroad cars. So Satan's message plays out. The Seagate was, was destroyed. But how does that get water down into the flicker? These were coal-fired ships. So they had to be able to store coal and the coal was stored down below the car deck. So there were grates 
where every couple runs, they would bring train cars full of coal, open up the bottom and pour the coal into the hoppers. And if you can kind of see my black lines that are appearing here, so they're open grates in the deck. Now you would think if you have an open deck, you would put hatches on those grates. What the divers on the wreck found is there is no hatch, nor is there a combing to hold the hatch. It's not like the hatches were blown off in the sinking or had maybe rotted away with time. There is no device there to, to batten down any sort of hatch over these grates. So clearly what was going on is once the sea gate was damaged, waves were rolling into the boat and pouring through those open grates down into the bottom of the ship and flooding the cruise quarters. The Grand Trunk Railroad claimed that that's not the case. There were hatches. They, don't, they can't explain why the ship may have sunk. And of course, they did not have access to the wreck at the time. But then a couple of weeks later, this announcement appears in the local newspaper that Grand Trunk's going to be fitting watertight hatches in all of their vessels. I didn't know you needed to outfit hatches where there already were. And so the Milwaukee story ends there. I told you, I was gonna tell you about three and a half shipwrecks. We know where the three car ferries that were lost were, or relatively knew where they were. If you think about it, it's pretty amazing. The, the car ferries ran for 60 or 70 years and only three founder. There were accidents at docks and things, but only three are lost due to a sinking. Fast forward with me to the spring of 2005, and there is a group out there actually looking, I believe, for a lost airplane. And so they're towing their sonar fish and they're watching the screen and this pops up. Well, now that looks like train tracks, but that can't be because they were in Lake Michigan. They knew it wasn't the Milwaukee because at that point they knew where the Milwaukee was. It can't be the Pair Marquette 18 because they're in the wrong part of Lake Michigan. And it can't be the Marquette and Bessemer number two because they're in the wrong lake. What are they looking at? So they send some divers down to go investigate and the divers, they find this. They find the stern end of a car ferry with the upper cabins cut away, speared into the lake bottom. People always find long lost shipwrecks. We know of wrecks that went down that haven't been found yet. You're not supposed to find wrecks that don't exist. The history book said only three were lost. What is this? So they start asking around and they start asking some of the local waterfront bars where people have been gathering and sharing sea stories for generations. And some of the people started going, oh yeah, there was that one thing. Turns out from 1969 to 1970, the Ann Arbor number five, you can see her there in the middle, had a bunch of her uh, upper cabins um, cut away. And she was sunk right there to be used as a break wall while they were doing some piling work over by this plant. And so when the work was done, they raised these three barges and they cut away the forward half of this car ferry and they towed the stern half off to the scrapyard. The history books told us the Ann Arbor number five had been scrapped. Well, the bow section was scrapped. Turns out they were towing the stern section away to the scrapyard and it decided to sink instead. And so we have three and a half car ferries at the bottom of the lakes. Over time, the highway system and the rise of semi trucks took away some of the business from the trains. And as the 20th century rolled on, we see the car ferries dwindle and dwindle. Some go out of business. Some, some stayed in business for a while. They hung on, uh, the CNO hung on for quite a while. 
until ultimately there is only one car ferry left sailing. And if you go to Ludington, you can catch a ride on the SS Badger. She is the last of the car ferries. She was launched in the 1950s. She was launched to haul railroad cars. And in fact, the, the tracks are still on her, but they filled in the gaps in between with pavement and she hauls cars and passengers now. She is the only coal-fired steam engine ship operating in North America. She's been placed on the National Historic uh, Places Register. She's also a link of the highway US-10. So she's going to be around for a while because she is part of the federal highway system. And she's quite a fun ride. I've taken it several times, but she's the last one still operating. And she is a throwback to a couple generations ago now. And she's the last one crossing the lake. And I've had the opportunity to sail on her a couple of times. I've also seen her from the deck of my ship when I've been out working. And it's really kind of cool uh, to think that used to be normal. You know, that's something that the people for years, that was just life. And so it was always kind of a, a flashback to stand out on deck and watch a car ferry cross our path. So that is the story of the car ferries on the Great Lakes. And so that's all the stories I have for you. But does anyone have any questions? How did they regulate the tracks uh, from shore to ship, you know? This is going to go down, so this has got to go down. Right. Um, well, like any, any so the question was to how do they regulate the tracks? Uh, do you have to keep them level between the ship and the shore? And so ballast, for one thing, they're going to pump ballast in and out. The other thing they never did is the, the engines never went on the ship. Those heavy railroad engines never went aboard ship. They would use dummy cars. So they would run dummy cars up to the cars that had to come off, hook them up. So you're not putting all that weight on. And they had a very specific loading and unloading pattern. So you would take four cars off here and four cars, for, you wouldn't take the whole row off at once. And there were connectors between the rails. So if it moved a little bit, the rails would still hang together, but they were very, very specific in how they loaded and unloaded. <laughs> and there were a couple times when they forgot. Uh, one of the Ann Arbor boats up in the UP actually rolled over at the dock. Someone forgot the loading pattern. They put too many cars on one side and the thing flipped right on its side. Not Marquette. There were no, no railroad car ferries on Lake Superior. Um, it may have been Menominee though. Okay, yeah, it, I, it may have been. Okay. Yeah. We shipped a fireman one time from Ludington. He, he, he fired on a car ferry. This can't fire too hard. <laughs> Now that's something coming from a car ferry guy. Wow. You see those jobs posted once in a while for the Badger. They're, they're looking for coal passers. It's like, you just don't see those job postings anymore. Yeah. Yep. That was. Yep. So they got... They got, uh, they got big stainless steel boxes now. And they, um, every time they come back to Ludington, you'll see forklifts go on board and they pick up the boxes, they haul them out, put clean ones in. And they actually ship the ash up to Charlevoix now and it gets reused in the cement making process is what they do with it. You had a question. Yeah, so the, the typical cargo on railroad cars uh, really would be anything. It could be coal, it could be grain. Uh, some of the, some of the uh, box cars on the Milwaukee when it down, went down were carrying um, household appliances, sinks, toilets, uh, could, be, um, could be flatbed cars that are ca hauling um, automobiles. So it really could be 
anything. Pulp wood sometimes. Yeah. Can I stop the screen share? Oh, yeah. Got it. Sure. Hey, they worked for years, right? They worked for years, and I I don't think they disappeared from the lakes that long ago. I I think maybe seventies or eighties. Yeah, but I I think those canisters hung around for. Even after you know radio and everything else, I think people the kept them. Guard, the Coast Guard made them, you know, made them. Sure. You gotta have so many in, this, in each lifeboat. Sure. Huh. So they didn't want to scratch it. Right. There's something else to do. Right. Someone's got to polish the brass of the canisters, right? Yeah. Keep keep the deck hands busy. Any anybody else? Any other questions? Well, thanks a lot, folks. I, I always appreciate coming here. And uh, like I said, this is probably my favorite of my presentations to give. So thanks for taking time out this kind of, kind of warm Thursday night. <laughs> Spring might show up eventually, but I really appreciate you coming out and, and sharing the stories with me.